Yes, I'm, I'm not leading you through the Landes Museum, which of course would be nice, but would have um, cost lots of more preparation because I'm, I'm not living in Mainz, but uh, well, much north of it. Mainz today on the Rhine is the capital of uh, Rheinland-Pfalz, which is a state in Germany. You know that we have, a, or you might know, that we have a federal system. So Mainz is the capital of Rheinland-Pfalz. Mainz lies on um, the um, Renus Rhein, uh, opposite of Mainz on the other side. In ancient times was um, um, Castellum Matiacorum or Mainz Castell, which is today Wiesbaden, the uh, capital of um, Hessen. So you have today, it, this is a major center, <clears throat> lots of people living here, I think half a million people uh, living here. Most of them do not care about ancient history, but <laughs> um, they have lots of inscriptions. And um, today I'm going to present to you a couple of, of these inscriptions. And of course, I have to make a selection um, because uh, there are thousands of inscriptions preserved from the area of Mainz. Uh, the, the ancient name is Moguntiacum. You will also find Moguntiacum. There are a um, couple of um, versions of this name. Like, well, this is not that untypical. Same with Leon. Um, which you will find Lugudunum and Lugdunum. So there are different, um, different versions, ancient versions. And uh, according to the database EDCS, which um, I um, presented to you this morning, there are more than five and a half thousand inscriptions uh, from this area. No, no, from mines. Um, if we um, take um, the whole area, there are probably around um, 7,000 inscriptions. It should be remembered, though, that EDCS also lists amphora stamps and other small inscriptions, not just stone inscriptions. Nonetheless, lots of inscriptions here in mines. Mainz and the immediate surroundings of the city are in many respects a representative example of Germania Superior or Upper Germany. Um, that's what the province is called usually in English. Um, on the one hand, Mainz has been the provincial capital and for this, for this reason alone, it was a political and cultural center. Further, we also have large troop movements here. Uh, you can see this in this table, um, especially in the first century AD. Not only were several legions transferred to and withdrawn from the Rhine, whose soldiers came mainly from Northern Italy and the Gallia Narbonensis, um, but auxiliary troops are also docu documented here, and these came from Spain, Gaul, and the Danube region, among others. So in this table, you see um, at the top, you have um, time charts, and you see the uh, different uh, legions um, that are, um, well, from, from which we know that they have been, at least for a time, in uh, Mainz. Um, the 22nd Legion Primigenia was the so-called House Legion of Mainz. It was here from the end of the first, first century AD, well, un, until ancient, late, uh, late antique times. So we have lots of soldiers from this uh, legion attested here, but from the other legions too. Um, and then, as I told you, we do also have lots of auxiliary um, troops here, a couple of Ale, 
and well, lots of cohortes one numerus, um, and in the brackets you find the time um, in which these cohortes and all of these um, auxilia are attested here in Mogontiacum. So we find here in Mainz a melting pot of different traditions and um, cultures. In the following, I will limit myself to a couple of interesting inscriptions which give us an insight into the religious conditions of Mainz between the first and the third century AD. Further, further, I will draw your attention again and again to the editing practice of inscriptions. But first, an overview of the deities of the gods and goddesses uh, documented in Mainz and its surroundings on the basis of inscriptions. Please excuse that the table is uh, written in um, German, but I think the the numbers and names can speak for themselves. Um, the table on the left lists the deities. On the top, the most frequent mentioned gods. On the bottom, the least mentioned ones. In the columns to the right, these consecrations are divided into time periods further distinguished into civil and military consecrations. On the far right are the total numbers. I did this myself um, a couple of years ago and I updated it um, last year. So the red numbers are the civil dedications for gods and goddesses. The black numbers are military dedications. And on the far right, these are added, uh, um, there's the addition of these numbers. And you see that Jupiter Optimus Maximus, we met him to, uh, already today, is the uh, well most attested um, god in Mainz. Sometimes he has attributes like Jupiter Optimus Maximus Conservator or Jupiter Optimus Maximus Dolichenus or Sebasius Conservator. But usually in 40, 40 uh, cases, it's just IOM. And you see that, um, that we have more military um, dedications than civil ones. Um, in other cases, uh, with other gods, it's the other way around. But <clears throat> altogether, we have Weihungen uh, insgesamt, that's the, um, here on the bottom, um, in bold, that's the inscriptions altogether. We have 271 inscriptions. On these 271 inscriptions, there are 325 um, gods altogether mentioned because in a couple of inscriptions or in many inscriptions, there's more than one God mentioned. So that's why we have more men mentions than uh, dedications. In a couple of fragments, the name of the God or goddess is not preserved. This is the, um, the second to last line here. And um, well, it's interesting to compare the number of dedications um, with the number of funerary inscriptions. And you see that um, the funerary inscriptions, they are much more civil funerary inscriptions. And most of them um, come from the first century AD, while there are almost no inscriptions in the second and third um, century AD anymore, which is an enigma for minds. This is um, a puzzle which is not yet solved, that the number of dedications um, in the second and third century, it's, this is typical for most Roman provinces that in the Severian, during the Severian dynasty, we have most of the dedications. There's a trend, there's um, uh, people, people get um, excited about putting up an inscription. 
Um, so this is, this is not very um, surprising that between 194 and 235, um, we have most of the dedications. But the, um, these numbers for the funerary inscriptions, these are puzzling. And as I told you, so far, this puzzle is not yet um, explained. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of um, possible explanations, but um, scholarship has not yet um, come to a, um, opinio communis. Yeah. So the consequence is that we know lots of soldiers from funerary inscriptions from the first century AD, but not that many soldiers um, from funerary inscriptions from later times. Yeah, if you have an idea, um, <laughs> I would like to discuss that because this <laughs> is um, um, keeping me busy for some time already. Okay, this you see um, lots of um, gods are attested only once, which um, demonstrates that personal preferences in antiquity were extremely diverse. And there was no uniform worship, even if time-related preferences existed, of course, as we will see. One could list and discuss many more interesting details based on this table. But of course, I want to show you some inscriptions. Just one more thing. Um, you can cert one can certainly criticize the table uh, that a classification of civil or military is not always possible. Some inscriptions do not reveal the occupation of the person mentioned. Sometimes the corresponding part is not preserved but lost. Sometimes, and we will see a couple of examples, private and military interests are mixed in inscriptions. So that the classification is difficult. Never, nevertheless, um, a division makes sense because a large number of inscriptions shows clear trends and fashions for soldiers and civil persons. So the, um, that, um, the, uh, that the numbers um, are very low in the second half of the third century, this is not very surprising because this is this is usually the case in all Roman provinces outside of Italy. Um, the trend of putting up an inscription is just um, not as attractive as it was before. Mm. Okay, certainly in one or two cases of so-called civil dedication, although for reasons unknown to us, they have refrained from naming their troop membership. An example is the donation of a stager, which I will show you next. So who would, this is an easy inscription, who would like to give it a try? Or maybe it's not that easy. Anybody who would like to decipher one line, maybe the first, second or third? El Prisco, uh, second line. Very good. El, so probably Lucius, and then we have Prisk, right? And last line. Messor. Very good. So we have a person here. Um, Lucius, the gentil nomen starts with Prisk. There are um, a couple of uh, possibilities. Priscius, Priscinius, um, and the uh, cognomen is Messor, which is quite popular. So this is the um, dedicant, the one who um, financed the inscription. And in the first line, we look for a god. Any idea? M A R Mill. Very good. 
100% correct, what, could, what kind of God could it be? Marte. Sorry? Marte. Very good. Mars. Mars. Very good. Correct. And M-I-L, any idea? Militaris. Very good. Very good. So, um, Mars uh, Militaris, or in, in dative, Marti Militari. And then you would write it down like this. Uh, Lucius Prisk. Well, there are a couple of um, possibilities, as I told you. Messor. Um, Mars Militaris, in this time, end of first, beginning of second century AD. So this is probably a soldier who financed this inscription or this, um, possibly it's a postament for a, for a stature. What would you think uh, if he's a soldier? Is, was he a legionary soldier or an auxiliary soldier? I would say legionario. Correct. Why? Because of the uh, onomastic elements, Lucius and Priscus. Right. So he has the tria nomina. Yes, um, exactly. And um, that's, that means he is a, he's a Roman. And uh, so he is... Well, it's pr pretty probable that he is a member of um, a Roman legion. We do not know why he uh, did not give um, the information of which legion. We do not know why he um, did suppress the information about his, uh, about his position, uh, whether miles or optio or whatever. Uh, there's, there's room in the inscription, but he just didn't didn't want to mention these details. We don't know. This is quite often the case. But he should be a legionary. How would you check? How would you check if the abbreviation Mar for Marti is, is often or not so often? How would you check that? Sorry, could you repeat, please? Yes. Um, how, what, what way would you go if you would like to check, if you would like to uh, um, look up if, uh, uh, whether the um, abbreviation MAR is often attested for Marti or not? How would you do that? In a search on uh, a uh... Yes, DC. Right, right. You would just um, put in Marti and then you would uh, search the results uh, by typing in MRA, uh, MAR uh, bracket, TI bracket. And then you would see that um, actually this um, abbreviation is quite seldom attested, 34 times among uh, over 1,000 uh, dedications for mass. Typically, this, uh, uh, typical is this abbreviation on uh, finger rings, where you do not have that much room. Um, yeah. The earliest preserved dedication of a soldier is the next one, of a soldier in mines. So what is strange about this picture? It's not a photograph. <laughs> Right? So this is a um, drawing okay. from an old publication from the 18th century. And uh, in Mainz, you often have to uh, rely on these publications because um, the inscriptions were often used for uh, new buildings, especially castles in the 18th century. And this guy, uh, Fuchs, 
who was an abbe in uh, Mainz, he made lots of uh, drawings and these drawings are not always reliable. Here we have a couple of problems in this um, inscription. What is sure is that there is a man mentioned who is probably, whose who's, uh, cognomen probably is Valens. The writing Valens for Valens is, uh, um, is a couple of times attested, but it might be that, that uh, Fuchs forgot the N. And um, he was Medicus uh, Legionis uh, Quarte Macedonicae. And we know that this legion um, was in Mainz between uh, the end of the 30s and uh, 70 AD. So this is an early inscription from Mainz. Um, well, and this Gentil Nomen ended with a Neos. Eos, you know that probably is typical for Gentil Nomina. Um, and it was discussed in scholarship whether this was a funerary inscription or an inscription for Jupiter Optimus Maximus. Um, I think it was an inscription for Jupiter Optimus Maximus because the formula dis manibus in abbreviated <laughs> form um, is not that early attested in mines in, uh, in, in between the 40s um, and uh, 70 AD. So this, this would be too early for DM, these manibus. Why do we have these letters on the top of the uh, fragment? I don't know, but this might be some modern um, letters. It happens that um, ancient, ancient um, inscriptions were not only reused for uh, modern buildings, but that people um, worked in, put in some uh, modern, uh, well, words, inscriptions, and so on. So it happens uh, relatively often that inscriptions are only known from old drawings some of the inscriptions have been uh, well used in, um, as I told you, in uh, modern buildings. But at least in Germany, I don't know uh, whether this is the case in Italy, lots of calcarian inscriptions went into lime melts for the man manufacture of cement, of cementitium, modern um, cementitium, um, in course of industrialization. And of course, many inscriptions were lost in the world wars. In many cases, they have also been reused, as I told you. And at least in Germany, um, inscriptions were not collected until the 19th century, when uh, many, many antiquity societies were founded in Germany. Before that, Latin inscriptions were something for nerds, well, like today, probably. And... Uh, people did not care about Latin inscriptions. Um, as you know, there was something like, well, uh, freedom of uh, religion in the Roman Empire, at least as long as the emperor's cult was not neglected, particularly popular among the soldiers, including those of Mainz, was the worship of Eastern deities. In the past, it was assumed that this was in the northwestern provinces, not, not the case until the advanced second century AD. New evidence has changed this picture. The, the Isis and Mata Magna sanctuary in Mainz, which is now well known and which was built with the help of the military shows that Eastern rites were already practiced in Mainz in Flavian times. There are two important inscriptions, which I show you here, from the temple explicitly referring to the welfare of the army. Who would like to try to read the, the, the inscription on the top? Pro salute Augustorum. Et situada et exercitus 
Matrimania Claudian Augustus eh, Lickmas. Tuli, Tuis, Tidere, Tui, Tulis, Cess, Sacer, Clau, Ast, Collis. Very good for the beginning. It's, it's becoming more, um, more difficult at the end of the inscription. Um, so this is the reading Pro Salute Augustorum, Senatus Populique Romani et Exercitus, Matri Magne, Claudia Augusti Liberta, Icmas, et vitulus sacce caesaris um, servus would be here could could be written here caesaris um, servus sacce dote claudio attico liberto and you see my translation on the right so this um, or these inscriptions were, at least for me, kind of surprising uh, because we have Pro Salute Augustorum. How would you date that? Usually, how would you date that? Augustorum. The emperors. Emperors, yeah. When, when do we have more than one emperor? During the second century. Yeah, very good. More exactly, maybe? Vero. Right. Um, uh, um, Mark Aurel uh, and uh, Lucius Verus. Right. So this was interesting here that uh, we have this inscription from Flavian times. And first, I didn't want to believe it. Um, but the archaeological context is clear. Um, this temple was given up at the beginning of the second century AD. And so, um, as I wrote in my, in my translation, uh, Pro Saluta Augustorum, well, it's probably, it, it can also relate to the members of the imperial house, not only to more than one emperors. Yeah. And um, this inscription is not only pro salute Augustorum, but also uh, for the benefit of the Senate and uh, Populi Romani and Ex Ecitus. So this is a genitive also here. And then we have um, the goddess named Mata Magna, Hübele in, in, in another name. And we have this, um, this uh, former slave um, from the uh, imperial house, uh, Claudia, um, who might have been freed by uh, Claudius, Emperor Claudius, and uh, her former slave name, Ikmas. And um, she, maybe with her husband or a friend, Vitulus, who is still a um, slave in the same household. And uh, at the end, we have something like um, a date, not under the uh, consulate of um, A and B, but under the priesthood or under the priest Claudius um, Atticus, who is also a freedman and who, um, if we consider his name, is probably also a freedman from the imperial house. So this um, inscription was not only important because of its, um, its text, but also because uh, people did think that Eastern um, gods were not worshipped uh, 
until the um, um, well second half second century and here we see that already in Flavian times in minds these kinds of gods these kind of gods were worshipped and um, there was a discussion about a mitreum in minds whether uh, this mitreum is early or late and now there is more argument that it can also be an early material. How would you characterize again these inscriptions? How do they look like? What are they made of? But the form, what form do we have again? Tabula ansata. Right, we have two tabulae ansate, um, which probably hang, um, well, maybe at the temple. So this might be the uh, founding inscription we actually don't know because it is not mentioned but there are no more important inscriptions from these temples so probably um, these inscriptions um, mark the well the founding of the temple interesting is that um, the ex Erkitus, the Roman army is mentioned and we know from the archaeological context from the roof of the temple that the um, that the roof construction, the, uh, how do you call them, the bricks were uh, from the military. They came from the military, so probably the military uh, was invo involved in the building of this temple. Um, what are the differences between the inscription on the top and the one below? The god. The god, right, very good. Isis Panthea. <laughs> On the yes. lower one, what else? Uh, have uh, a little letter inside the C in the la in the last line uh, in the first inscription. I didn't get it, but you're talking about the last letter in the last line of the of the uh, the first inscription. The but yeah. uh, Claudius, mm. okay, the L is uh, big in yeah. the second. Yeah. So the the last letter is already in the frame of the inscription, right? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> so the. This is when I prepared this, when I prepared this lecture. I had a look at both inscriptions, and um, well, the upper one is not um, is not um, is poorer planned than the lower one. The lower one is better worked into the stone, to my mind. The upper one, you see that the last line is already uh, ending in the frame and um, the text is not well um, put into the tabula. The first line is not in the center. Well, the second is only in the center if you consider that this is, um, that this is a word, um, a signal for the end of a world word right here too <coughs> so this is not well ordained into the uh, stone this one is much better and one might come to the conclusion that the lower one is maybe earlier or later because it's better made yeah, but we can't we can't tell much from this um, fact that the upper one is well not well um, made. Yeah. Okay. Am, am I wrong? Or yeah. The, the, the first one was recarved. I see two remains of two letters on on the frame on the upper frame. Two T's maybe. You think this is the second time that this inscription was made? Or what? I didn't get it. Uh, before the first line in the upper frame, I see two upper part of two letters, probably two T's. Here? No, uh, in the center. 
just up above uh, Augustorum, at, at the S, where's the... Here? Uh, yes. Oh, this? Yes, exactly. Oh, this? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You, you think this could be a T here? Yes. In the frame. And then we would have an... Um, a re-inscription. A first story. inscription, okay. Yes. Good idea. I, I didn't actually, I didn't notice this before. You might be right. Mm. Yeah. And then this, this is the second one. And this was, um, this was erased. And this uh, was left over from the first one. Okay. Well, as far as I know, these inscriptions are still not published um, like an edition. I, uh, Wolfgang uh, wrote, Wolfgang, are you still online? Yeah, and I published them um, two years ago, I think. I don't remember that you mentioned these T's. <laughs> oh, I have seen this inscription and I, um, I saw that this, this was an ornament, but uh, I don't recognize that it was T's. It's very mm. unusual. But uh, it, it's a second uh, inscription. Uh, it's right, and so maybe uh, oh, I'm, I'm not sure. But I I thought it wasn't were ornaments. But yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One would have to check this again. Well, to check it again because it was for me. It was impossible. Uh, you, you know that this uh, excavation there uh, to to make take measures and a, uh, a squeeze or something else. It, it's yeah. a little bit difficult. The special situation that are in minds, but I I want to talk about that. <laughs> I don't want to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, these inscriptions are in a in a kind of little museum, and they are hanging yeah. right right uh, on the top of the wall. Uh, Wolfgang is talking about um, this, that it's um, very difficult to um, have a good look at this inscription. I took these photographs you see here, um, and uh, well, even that was not that easy. And Still, I, I use uh, Kreschel's photographs for my edition. There are no better ones uh, until now, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I made them as a visitor there. Yeah, it, it, it's still not allowed to take pictures. I just did it um, and nobody complained so far because I did not publish them, Wolfgang did. Yeah, so we'll see. But um, if, this, if these two, um, these two uh, uh, things are not Maybe a kind of decoration, but uh, leftovers from letters. Then it's still interesting that we have um, we have this second inscription with almost um, the same words, except for well, except for uh, Isis Panthea, uh, who is named here. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Maybe the double T are um, a measurement for a space for epigraphic space. Yeah, but, no? but that's too deep worked into the stone for help. You mean help lines or something like that? Yes. No, I no. don't think so. Too, um, they are too deep worked into the stone. They look to me like letters, but one had, one have to, we will have to check that one day. <laughs> Not today. Yeah, but thanks for the, um, for the hint. I'll mark it and I'll, I'll check it. Okay. Um, so, uh, what I learned from these inscriptions is that um, when emperors are mentioned uh, in plural, <clears throat> that we do not have to talk about a joint uh, uh, reign. And the first one um, it was mentioned was uh, from 161 to 180, uh, uh, no, 161 to 169, uh, Mark Aurel and Lucius Verus. This was uh, kind of new for me. Local deities were, of course, also worshipped in mines, as the next inscription shows. And this was published by um, myself, a couple of... Um, 
years ago, I uh, this um, stone was uh, newly discovered, uh, but it's lost. There was an um, a colleague found a manuscript with inscriptions, and he was just interested in the Jewish ones, and asked me to well to look uh, the Latin ones up. And this one is uh, is from Mainz, but it's lost today. And um, well, it's not 100% correct the way it is um, written down here, but it was uh, no problem to uh, read it. What we have here is a dedication for the Matrone. Um, and right after the name of the Matrone comes the formula Votum Solvit Libens Letus Merito. And then we have here a Gaius Julius Felix, and he was a sesquiplicarius ale nuricorum. Sesquiplicarius is not that often uh, mentioned in inscriptions. That's a soldier who is paid one and a half of the usual uh, payment. Sesquiplicarius. Um, yes, and he was. Um, Although he was uh, serving in an ala, in an auxiliary troop, um, he is a Roman who, well, might have, um, he or his uh, forefathers might have gotten their citizenship um, during the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Um, we know that this unit was stationed around the middle of the first century AD and from 78 AD onwards. It had then been uh, moved to Germania Inferior, the Ala Nuricorum. In the year 78, it uh, was moved from Mainz to Germania Inferior and there it still stood in the 60s of the second century. And this man either became acquainted with the cult of the Matrones in Lower Germania and had the inscription created during a visit to his former place of employment in Mainz, or he had the inscription made before 78 when he was um, still stationed in Mainz. This would have meant that the cult of the Matrones was in this case not an import from Lower Germany, but from Upper Italy, which is undoubtedly also possible. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, the word says quiplicarius is written different on the drawing. Yeah. Well, this is a mistake here. It, okay. it, it can't be anything else. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, um, I forget, I for, uh, I think his name is Felden or Falden who wrote this inscription down. And um, there are sometimes uh, minor mistakes. He obviously, when he, when he wrote down the inscription, he ob obviously didn't understand a lot. He saw some points between ab abbreviations and he possibly he uh, considered that these points were put when, um, when the syllable was, was um, did end. So, ma, tron, nis, maybe, I don't know. There was no point here for sure in the original, maybe a damage. And then he understood probably the first three lines, maybe Felix, and then he didn't understand this word. See, ah, and an L is missing here. Maybe it was an L with an I on it. But it's, it's sure that this was a sesquiplicarius ale nuricorum. Yeah, but okay. you're right. The, the, the inscription is not 100% correct. Uh, even the, the, the Q uh, means, uh, it seems a, a no. Yeah, well, this is typical. <laughs> o and Q is almost the same. This is not a problem um, that the, um, the, the cauda of the, um, this, this little um, 
detail of the cue is missing. It might be a damage, might have been a damage in the stone or he just didn't see it. He wrote down, he also wrote down a couple of inscriptions when these inscriptions went into the building of a castle. And from his uh, manuscript, um, well, he, he wrote down a couple of inscriptions and there were only two we didn't know. The other ones we knew already and we have them already. We, we still have them. And we, we see that he was, um, that he was uh, well, he, he wrote them down quite, quite correctly. There were others who made more um, mistakes. And we, might, we might find this stone one day then we will know for sure. It has to be somewhere. The next inscriptions show that when members of the military made a consecration on their own, obviously no clearly identifiable preferences for special gods can be discerned. Not even when several consecrations by the same soldier have been handed down. For example, we have this inscription, which is uh, very good readable. Who wants to try? What god is mentioned? Mercurio. Uh, right. Deo Mercurio. Mercurio. Um, Tiberi. Then. Tiberi. Right. Tiberius. Justini, and there's a little UNS, you can't see it, but maybe if you, this yeah. very little S here, and above the S is a V. And um, so Tiberius Justini, Os, Elia, Augusta, which is the ancient name of um, Augsburg in Bavaria. Um, Elia Augusta Natus, and then his um, cognomen Titianus, and he was a beneficiarius, so kind of um, 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 legionary on, uh, for special duties, and he was beneficiarius of the uh, legatus legiones, legati legiones, due et vicesime of the sec, um, 22nd uh, legion, which is the house legion of, uh, I mentioned it already, house legion of Mainz, et Servandia Augusta Eius, uh, votum solverunt, because that's two of them. And then we have Faust. This is very crazy, full of ligatures here. The one who wrote down the inscription had lots of fun um, uh, doing as many as ligature as he could. Faustino et Rufino Consulibus. So we can date this inscription into the year 210. Um, it might, uh, we might have to um, consider that on the top, which is quite often the case, that on this, on this um, top of this ara was a, uh, another line with in honorem domus divine. Might be. For the secondary use of this stone, the top was, um, was uh, um, reworked in modern times, same with the button, so it could fit into a wall. Um, yeah, this is an interesting um, inscription, which mingles um, military and civil um, things we have this, uh, we have this uh, legionary who comes from um, Elia Augusta from Augsburg and his wife who has two names, Servandia Augusta. So she probably had the name Servandia and then she, when she came to Mainz, she had to differ her, herself from others. And that's why she was called Augusta because she also came from Elia Augusta. Eius means she's his, of course, his wife. Um, interesting is this inscription also because we have, uh, we have this, this man on another inscription from Belgica. Um, on the top left, uh, this is again the one from Mainz. And this is the second one which mentions the same legionary. And here he 
favorites completely different gods. On the top, Dea Epona and Genio Leucorum, Genius Leucorum. And then again, Tiberius Justinius Titianus, Beneficiarius, Legati Legionis, this, this was all damaged in the inscription. Um, Duet Vicesime Primigenie Pia Fidelis. And then Antoniniane, this is um, a later uh, attribute to this legion, ex voto posuit. So what are the differences between this inscription and the other one, except for the gods already? What else is different? The councils are missing. Sorry? The councils. Yes, there's no uh, date with the consuls. At least it's not preserved and probably it, it's missing. We have pictures of this, uh, this inscription uh, from Belgica, but this drawing is just better than the inscription. Yes, the consuls are missing. Who's else missing? <laughs> the wife. Uh, wife. Also not mentioned. <laughs> he left her at home. In... Uh, yes, of yeah, course. It, so, yeah, she, she is still in Mainz, prob uh, probably, where the, his legion was stationed. She, um, she was left at home. And, well, what is also missing is... is the, the name of the legion. The, no, the name, name of the legion is, is here. More, Primigenia, yes. Pia Fidelis, Antoniniana. Right. The second. Right. It's interesting that when the legionary has this dedication with, with his wife that he um, leaves these attributes from the legion that he just leaves them away. And here again, he leaves his uh, place of birth away. Elia Augustanatus uh, is not mentioned here. And then totally different gods. On the one hand, Dea Epona. Does anybody know what Epona is uh, famous for? She's a goddess of horses. Right, right. She's not that much uh, popular in Italy, I think. In Northern Italy, she is because it's Celtic. In the Celtic, um, uh, among the Celtic gods, Epona is quite uh, important. We have uh, lots of literary um, sources about her. And she's the goddess of horses. And we see her here on the left side. And then on the, on the right, we have the Genius Leucorum which is um, the, the genius of the Loiki, and the Loiki live in, uh, in this area where this inscription was put up in Gallia Belgica. This inscription was heavily indebted, indebted by the place where he, uh, where he was serving. He probably was sent with, uh, on a mission from his uh, boss, from the Legatus Legionis, um, to Belgica, and there he decided to put up this <coughs> inscription. So this is quite uh, seldom the case that we have more than one uh, inscriptions uh, mentioning the same persons. Uh, the, the initials of the legion name, PPF. Yes. Um, but there's no space for the, the layers on the, I mean, uh, the, the, the line uh, would yeah. not be centered uh, yeah. if it were the, 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 the layers. Yeah, um, this line is probably not centered, but we, we have to put here LEG, Lega, Legati Legionis. And then you have here PPF. Ah, okay. Okay. Um, okay. But of course, otherwise you'd be right. If, if the line was centered, but we have to, we have to uh, assume that uh, he is beneficiarius again because he's on a special mission and uh, each and every be beneficiarius mentions whether he is beneficiarius of, a, of the legatus legionis or legatus augusti pro pretore. Uh, and we have a couple of other um, high officers who have the right uh, to um, have beneficiarii uh, in their service. Mm -hmm. But uh, most often it's the Legatus Legionis or the Legatus Augusti Propretore or Legatus Consularis and so on. 
Okay. Um, next is a difficult uh, inscription. I'm not going to ask you to read it. Uh, again, this is interesting because there are two people mentioned in this inscription who are mentioned in more than one inscription. We have here a dedication for uh, Mass and Victoria and then Pro Salute. Well, and this is just gone away. Any idea why? Damnatio Memoria. Right. Damnatio Memoria. So the emperor, uh, the emperor's name was erased. Um, Rasura. And um, further down, we have leftovers of the names. Quintus Aurelius Polus Terentianus. Cum Quinto Aurelio Polo Zuriaco Filio. Fetianus. Well, how do we know? Most of it is readable, but we know it uh, in the first case uh, from the second um, inscription, which you can see here. This one is for Liber Pata at Apollo and it's Pro Salute. And here the name of Commodus is erased, but it's still quite, uh, lots of letters are readable and we can, we can reconstruct the, um, the form, the name of the emperor was written down in this inscription. Um, where I put a dot, there, you, there we can still uh, read parts of the, um, of the letters. And when you have a rasura, when a name or a part of an inscription is erased, you usually to put two brackets on each side to mark that the damage was made uh, on purpose. Um, so just the name of the emperor was erased. And then again, we have Quintus Aurelius Paulus Terentianus, cum again with his son, Quintus Aurelius Paulus Zyriacus, his son, Fetialis, this is, uh, this is his father. This is not, um, not uh, the son. And uh, this, Guy is quite uh, important because you can see that he is he himself is legatus legione duo et uh, vicesime um, primigenie pie fidelis item legionis secunde auguste. This provoked lots of discussion how this guy could be legatus legionis from two legions, especially since the second legion was stationed in Britannia. <laughs> Um, scholarship explained it uh, in this way. They think that he was that the that he put up the stone in the last days of his um, uh, legature in uh, in Mogontiacum in Mainz, and that he was about to take over the command in Britannia. And this is perfectly plausible to my mind. And this is why we can uh, uh, we can date this um, inscription because this um, uh, this Quintus Aurelius Paulus Terentianus is well known from other inscriptions. Um, he was um, fetialis. What is a fetialis? It's a person uh, uh, that uh, make bellum uh, justum. Right. Um, so priests, a group of priests who were responsible in Republican times for the declaration of war. You might um, remember the Hasta Fetialis, which was um, thrown into the area of the, um, of the enemy in, um, well, in Republican times, in early Republican times. And later on, um, it... Well, they were still, um, they still had to um, check the declaration of war, but they were not any more as, as important as they were in, um, in Republican times. 
usually it became a um, honorary uh, priesthood for senators. And this is the case here too. Uh, well, interesting is that this, uh, this, this man, this Legatus Legionis and his son, um, dedicated an, uh, an, an ara to uh, Mars and Victoria uh, first, and a little bit later, probably another altar for uh, Liber and Apollo. And this is well, this is explained um, by Mars and Victoria uh, is, a, is a special and popular combination in Mainz. And probably they paid respect to this, um, to this um, fashion in Mainz. And the second, um, uh, the second dedication uh, pays respect to, um, well, maybe to their origin. Lieber Pater is an Eastern, um, Eastern God, and this is well. At least this is discussed in scholarship that um, this might explain the choice of gods in this second inscription. Uh, Fetialis were responsible also for making treaties, right? Making what? Uh, uh, treaties. Yes, yes. In republican times. Okay. Not in imperial times anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. In a, in in uh, in republican times, they were uh, bothering with uh, with what you would call today um, uh, ministry for foreign relations. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, in German, Außenminister. Um, so what we uh, what we see here is uh, one point which to my mind has not yet been um, fully, fully noticed by scholarship that lots of important persons paid respect to um, regional um, gods to, well, to just to show we came and we respect what we found here. There are a couple of examples which, um, to my mind, I, I haven't had the time yet, but which to my mind um, have to be, um, well, there, I think there are lots of examples which have to be collected and studied. Two examples here from two other cities uh, on the left, Bonn, Bonna in Germania Inferior, and on the right, uh, Strasbourg, um, which is also Germania Superior. And you see the, here the dedication for local gods. Um, on the left, Aufaniabus. These are Matrone um, Aufanie, very popular in uh, Lower Germany. And uh, the one who is uh, venerating them here is Lucius Calpunius Proclus, Legatus Augusti Legionis, Prime Minerviae Pie Fidelis. And on the right, we have um, also a Legatus Augusti. We don't know whether he was Propretore or, uh, or um, Legionis, but also an important uh, person who um, financed a dedication for Renus Pater. And this is quite funny because um, uh, even today, Germans call uh, the Renus Vater Rhein, Renus um, Pater, which but which probably did not derive from ancient times. Well, but it's, it's interesting. So we have a couple of examples and there are more of important um, soldiers and politicians in imperial times who uh, financed um, inscriptions and uh, are and temples for um, uh, gods who were um, in the region where they served, who were uh, popular um, there. Um, next one inscription, with, which is um, quite famous. Have a look at it. Any idea, anybody? This is the burial inscription of the famous um, pre-taster um, of, the, of the emperor. 
Very good. <laughs> so, this manibus Tiberio Claudio Augusti Liberto Zosimo Procuratori Pregustatorum Imperatoris Domitiani Caesaris Augusti Germanici Hoc Monumentum Heredem Non Sequitur. Yes, a famous inscription. Um, this is a tabula, which probably was in a burial monument uh, like this. A tumulus monument. If you have been in Rome, you, you will know it um, from uh, Augustus, for example, but there are lots of examples. The, right, the one here on the right is an example from the Eiffel area with a different inscription uh, worked into it. It's a reconstruction, but it might have been um, a monument like this. Um, so this, he, he is Procurator Pregustatorum. Uh, Mrs. Kecht, would you repeat what, what his job was? So he was the one to try the meals of the emperor, so he would not get um, any poisons in it. Right. He was the head of the tasters. That's how I um, translated it here. There might be a more elegant translation, but I don't know. Um, he is the head of the tasters of the Emperor uh, Domitian. Um, and we can date it by literary uh, sources. We know that Domitian was in, uh, in Mainz, Moguntiacum, in the years 83, 84 AD. Um, yeah, you know that he reigned from 81 to 90, 96. Um, he was a freedman. Who, who freed this uh, guy, Zosimus? Tiberio. Uh, well, T Tiberius is probably too early, but Claudius, Claudio. right, Claudius' name was, was also Tiberius Claudius, um, 41 until uh, 54 AD. And uh, well, this shows that this guy, um, Tiberius Claudius Zosimus, that he was quite successful <laughs> to, um, as a taster. Um, he, he survived and he did not only survive um, Claudius, he survived probably also, uh, he probably also worked for Nero and, uh, and uh, he continued uh, to work for the Flavians. So he, he was um, for a long time in his job and this is why he probably died of uh, natural causes and was not um, poisoned here in Mainz we would know from literary sources. We do not know anything from, um, from this kind of attack on uh, Domitian. Um, and he probably did, didn't have to uh, taste himself anymore because he was the head, the procurator of the uh, pregustat, uh, uh, pre he was procurator pregustatorum. So he probably organized um, this uh, tasting. Um, I have one uh, curiosity about the final formula. Yes. Um, it's, uh, it states that the, the tomb will not pass to the, to the air. Yeah. Right? Right. So the, 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 the tomb um, will be proper to of whom? Of the state? No. No, it does. Uh, this sentence mean that um, the hair is not allowed to be buried here too. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, we have the cases that um, that uh, we have uh, family burials. Mm -hmm. um, this is here. Uh, this it is not is the family huh? property. Right, family property, and this. Um, Monument, Monumentum Heredem Non Sequitur is actually a formula which is not that popular in, uh, in Upper Germania, but which is uh, very popular in the area of Aquileia and around Upper Italy. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw it uh, there lots of times. And um, well, people took care that uh, either hares were allowed to be buried there or not. Um, it's interesting and it's important that you, that you um, brought us to this point because uh, we have another inscription mentioning this guy, uh, but from Rome. And there um, he is, um, the inscription uh, is uh, Dis Manibus, and then we have um, a genitive uh, from Dis Manibus, which, which is, uh, uh, we have this, this is not that seldom. You have Dis Manibus, and then the name comes in nominative. We have Dis Manibus, and the name comes in uh, dative or in genitive. It also depends on the time. Here we have the genitive. Tiberi Claudi Augusti Liberti, Zosimi, Procuratoris Pregustatorum, and then uh, his wife, Claudia Entole, um, made it for her uh, deserving um, man, but meant is, I, I translated it here, husband, um, and Claudia Eustachus. Um, his daughter for um, the very loving father. Yeah, why do we do we um, have the sentence here in Mainz um, when his heirs uh, live in, in Rome? I don't know. Um, they probably didn't consider to go to Mainz to be buried there. I don't know. Uh, we also do not know who made this um, burial for uh, Zosimus in Mainz. What, but we, we can, well, we can deduct it from the inscription. What do you think? Who financed this funerary monument? The family. No, I don't think so. No. No, the second one in Rome was financed by the family. This one, probably not, no. Maybe um, his colleagues. His colleagues? Yes. Yes, might be his colleagues or the emperor himself. Okay. Because he worked for him and he was um, uh, part of his household, um, Augusti Libertus. So, or his colleagues might be, but probably not his wife and his daughter, who probably did not... Um, uh, um, travel with him because, um, well, we have the second uh, stone in Rome. So um, one of these stones is a kenotaph, which means a, um, an empty grave, mm-hmm. okay? Um, we can't have two graves for the same person. So it might be that the uh, grave in uh, Mainz is a kenotaph, um, or the one in Rome, when, when he was, he might have been burned in mines and his ashes might have been transferred to Rome, we don't know. But one or the other grave is a kenotaph. Okay. The Rome one. Sorry? The, the Rome, Rome one. one. Yeah, yeah, might be. Might be. We don't know. It depends on how much the emperor loved his procurator pregustatorum. I don't know. Um, but there are more possibilities uh, than one. Um, I don't know. But yeah, might be the Rome one because it's always kind of complicated to yeah. carry uh, the ashes. But it's not that complicated. I don't know. We so, Both is possible. I, I, can't, I can't say. Um, yeah, when we see these inscriptions where the daughter calls her father um, uh, Pientissimo and uh, the wife calls her husband uh, Viro Benemerenti, of course, we, we always ask, we always have to ask ourselves whether this um, um, mirrors the relation in ancient times. Um, sometimes people doubt that, sure that there uh, was... In this case, we have the same person. Sorry? Um, uh, how um, we are sure that we have the same person? 
in the, in the descriptions? Oh, um, well, the name is, is quite popular, might be, but Sosimus uh, Procurator Pregustatorum, that's not a coincidence. 100% sure. But maybe one is Tiber Tiberio and the other is, is Claudius. I don't know. Aha. Uh -huh. No. 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 The name of the, the the name of the procurator pregustatorum is Tiberius Claudius Sosimus, and um, uh, and um, right, 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 and he has yeah, right. Uh, he has the tria nomina, but he's a freedman, so he has no not full Roman citizenship, and um, he has no filiation. Tiberi but, Claudi, but is it uh, possible that one Zosimo uh, would be uh, free? Uh, by Tiberio and the other by by Claudius, and so the two of them would uh, would have the name Tiberius Claudius. Uh, everything is possible, but I don't think so. Okay. Um, we have uh, two times the same name. We have uh, the mm -hmm. same um, position, and um, uh, and both uh, are from the same time. And for me, this is 100% sure that this is the same person. Uh, I, I don't, um, I can't imagine anything else. Um, whether he was freed by um, uh, Tiberius, uh, Emperor Tiberius or Claudius, uh, we, we could discuss that, of course, whether this is possible that he was freed already by Tiberius, but then he, he, he would be in 83, 84, he would be very, very old, might be. One could discuss that, I think, but uh, for sure it's the same person. Nobody doubts that. Yeah, I just uh, uh, would like to do a little observation concerning your inscription, because uh, you show also previously inscription uh, uh, mentioning uh, Claudia Liberta, Augusti Liberta, and uh, there are many Claudian, Giulio Claudian Liberti that uh, will uh, stay in the service of the emperor later under uh, the Flavians yes. until the end of the Flavian dynasty. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think uh, it's a particular aspect uh, there is no change in the uh, offices uh, inside uh, the domus, uh, the imperial domus. Uh, there is a change in the family, but not uh, a real change uh, in, in the inner offices. And uh, probably this is to, at, at something to do with uh, the relationship, uh, the previous relationship of the family, the Flavian family with uh, uh, Claudius uh, and Nero, then uh, uh, some people uh, uh, working uh, under uh, Claudius and uh, uh, under Vespasian uh, may stay uh, on the same place and then it, is, uh, it may explain the continuity. Uh, is just uh, because uh, two, three different uh, monuments uh, are showing the same uh, aspect. Right. Right, and and for, but but for the Procurato Pregustatorum, it's <laughs> it's interesting that he survived that long and that. Um, a couple of uh, emperors who did not uh, have an, an, um, a narrow uh, relationship that, that they all of them trusted him. So this is, to my mind, this is uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. But you're right, of course, yeah, thank you. Um, of course, from the uh, last inscription, I asked uh, how, um, well, how believable are these attributes, pientissimo, um, Bene Merenti, um, well, uh, quite often I think uh, that there uh, was, um, even in ancient times, people loved each other, and we can see this from uh, inscriptions, and I think we have to, uh, we have to believe um, that these attributes, um, well, give us an insight into the relationship, although quite often probably 
uh, it was just written down to document um, a nice relationship towards the uh, public. Uh, well, like today, probably. Uh, sometimes it's true, sometimes it was just um, a documentation uh, for others. Uh, really? About that, uh, if I can. Sure. Uh, um, a sentimental language can also be seen in the epigraph of the Bet in Bologna, where the pater is uh, the, the the word pater is engraved under the name of the father, and uh, it it's really, you know, good to see the the sentimental the, the sentimental language uh, in the ancient Rome. Yeah, and there are many many epigraphs uh, uh, where this is a. Uh, you know, visible. Right. Well, sometimes we have um, uh, not in. I looked it up in in not in Germany, but in Italy we had we have quite often the phrase uh, "sine o la querella" um, that uh, people, um, uh, husband and wife, live together. Um, actually, the, the the sometimes it's even documented how long, like thirty years. Uh, seven months, uh, three days, yeah. and six hours without any fight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. But it mi this might resemble uh, the old um, uh, gender roles where yeah. women were not allowed to fight, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> uh, still, um, uh, quite often, um, things, things are uh, true, I think. Uh, for example, here we have this um, funerary inscription, Dis Manibus Octavie Capitoline, Domo Elia Capitolina, uh, Castissime Ac Pudicissime, Coniugi et Incomparabili, Vixit Anos uh, uh, um, Triginta et uh, Duo, et menses quinque dies quatuor, et Gaio Iulio Nepotiano equiti Romano filio, eios vixit annos duo menses undecim dies duo decim Iulius valens centurio uh, legiones um, uh, octava, uh, octave Auguste faciendum curavit. Um, yeah, again, an inscription which is uh, heavily damaged, but uh, the the letters um, are uh, all readable. And uh, well, this shows us how many people came to Mainz, to this capital of the province, Germania Superior. This um, Octavia Capitolina here uh, came from Jerusalem. Um, and she lived in Mainz and she died here in the age of uh, uh, 32, um, five months and four days with her son who was only two years old, 11 months and 12 days. And husband and father, Julius Valens, so um, did no the birthday of his wife and of his child, which is even today not always the case. And uh, uh, he knew all of it and uh, he um, declared that his wife wa was very decent, very modest and incomparable. Um, so this inscription has several uh, interesting points. Mine's as we see, was a port of call for people from all over the empire. Uh, we don't know. We don't know why Octavia Capitolina came to Mainz, but probably um, uh, her husband, the centurion, met his wife during an Oriental campaign under Caracalla or Severus Alexander, and took her with him to Upper Germany. And here in Mainz, she probably decided to took her second name, Capitolina, from her um, uh, place of birth. Like this other um, woman we had, uh, we talked uh, today, this Augusta from Elia um, Augusta, here from Elia Capitolina. So this Octavia decided to call herself Octavia Capitolina, probably to differ herself from other, other Octavia. 
Um, a little bit strange is that this uh, Centurio uh, from the Eighth Legion um, was in Mainz because this Eighth Legion was uh, stationed in uh, Strasbourg, and um, he, well, probably probably was um, on some military uh, on some mission in Mainz, or maybe he was um, um, he was uh, serving there for the uh, Legatus Augusti. We don't know. Mm. And as we can see in this inscription, probably his wife and his uh, son died at the same time and of the same uh, cause, probably an illness. The vocabulary castissima and pudicissima um, is otherwise... Um, more likely to be found in Italy. You, you might know it from Italy. Um, so the Centurio uh, might have come originally from, from uh, there because this uh, formula, castissima ac pudicissima, is, uh, I think this is the only case in uh, Germania Superior where we uh, find this in an inscription. Sorry. Yes. Uh, maybe uh, the use of uh, castissime uh, ac pudicissime uh, is, uh, was due uh, for, um, because he was a, a equitus, maybe. Uh, is, is, is this formula popular among um, equities? I don't know. Because uh, uh, the senatorian um, use uh, uh, in the epigraphies is uh, uh, castissime superlati uh, superlative, Superlativo assoluto, so come <laughs> maybe. Well, what, what is sure is that he is um, um, an equus Romanus um, because his son is, is it, is, is it, uh, is also one, yeah, with, with two, uh, two years. He's two years old and he's al already uh, equity Romano. Um, but I don't know whether this formula is um, exceptionally uh, popular among equities, but I, ha I, I haven't checked it. I have to admit okay. it might be, I, I don't know. Okay. Um, I will skip some inscriptions and maybe come to one last interesting this is an uh, inscription from Oberolm, which is today uh, not far away from uh, Mainz, a couple of kilometers. And again, we have here a, um, a Roman in, 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 a, in a top position or from a top position, Aulus Didius Gallus, uh, who was three times um, consul. And he is also a priest, Quindecimvir Sacris Faciundis or Faciendis. Both forms are correct. He's uh, Sodalis Augustalis. This is another priesthood. He's Sodalis uh, Flavialis, another priesthood. Sodalis Titialis, another priesthood. And his wife, um, Attica. And then uh, at the end, we have the goddess Nemetona, uh, uh, to whom this inscription or the the, uh, the inscription was fixed to to her, um, a dedication to whom this dedication was uh, was given um, and Nemetona who is the um, female partner of uh, Mars Lucetius is especially popular in Mogontiacum um, so this is again a pay of respect for a regional important goddess and her partner who um, were worshipped at Mainz. And this um, Aulus Didius Gallus uh, was accompanying uh, Domitian and probably together with this Procurator Pregustatorum, um, uh, they were all together. And he decided with his wife who uh, went with him uh, to give, uh, to uh, finance this dedication. Uh, scholarship considers that there was a second inscription um, uh, of uh, this, with the same words, 
uh, which was dedicated to Mars Lucetius, because in Oberolm we have a temple for Nemetona and uh, Mars Lucetius, and uh, probably they didn't just worship uh, the one without the other. I think this is it for today. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, I would uh, be happy to, to answer them if, if I can. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, about the datation of the last inscription. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it is mentioned Veiento Consul Tertium. Yes. But it's not in dated. No. But, um, well, I can't uh, tell you in... Uh, do you see it again? Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, we know his... Uh, we know when he was consul from the uh, Fasti Consularis. And um, um, it's not dated, this is true, but uh, he was uh, one of the um, partisans of Domitian and uh, it's quite probable uh, that uh, when we have him here without any um, official position in Germania Superior, uh, that he was accompanying uh, the emperor, especially since we know that uh, Domitian was there in Mainz and his Procurator Pregustatorum was there too. So um, it's not dated, this is true, but to my mind, it is quite clear that it is from this time. I don't know these consulates when, um, when um, the last one is uh, when we have to date it, but probably it's in, in the years right before 83, 84. But Tertium, uh, it's related to the third uh, consulate or? or yes. Not? Yes. Yes, he was three times consul, this guy. Okay. We, we could check this in, uh, or you could check it in, in Wikipedia. We have the uh, list of consuls in Wikipedia. <clears throat> and probably, probably he was um, together with Domitian uh, also consul. I'm pretty sure, but I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know it by heart. Um, the date is not my date, it's, it's from the uh, scholarship, but it's, there's no, no fight about it, as far as I know. Okay, thank you very much, Krezimir. Uh, so, we must pay attention when we find the, some, uh, thing, some inscription with uh, the text Pro Salute Augustorum. <laughs> huh. yeah. this this we say okay end of the it's second from... century <laughs> this was it's new for you east. Stefano yeah 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 for me too <laughs> <laughs> uh, a couple of years ago I was fighting with Wolfgang and he said uh, well Wolfgang you you know somebody who told you from the eastern uh, empire yeah. there are uh, examples I argumented from... in my article Yes, we have uh, a very similar formulation in Ephesus. Mm -hmm. So, uh, from the first century, from Domitian, uh, it means uh, his, uh, um, his father and his brother too. And so that it was an idea of uh, the colleagues of Vienna and we discussed it and uh, they convinced me. And uh, I think we have similar uh, formulations in the East and the West, and we have uh, that uh, and, uh, an imperial freed woman is a part of the, of the court, and she knows this. Very good, these formulations. And it would explain why we have this um, um, uh, um, Augustorum there. Yeah. The living and the dead. The usual case is that that when we have more than one, that we have to date it late. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you are uh, uh, totally right with Fabricius Veiento. He is a very important guy later on because he was one of the big supporters of Trajan. He was a third time consul, as well, one of the famous persons of the Senate in this time. And he was uh, together with Domitian, he was con had a consulship. And uh, yeah. Very, very famous person. Obviously, if you have uh, other question, uh, curiosity about uh, Mainz Museum, uh, 
to my right to crash me <laughs> in the evening and uh, have uh, all the solution. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Krasimir.